السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته نتوضع Welcome brother Muhammad Thank you very much please how are you how is your family Alhamdulillah we are doing fine thank you for asking I hope everything is well with your family and community Alhamdulillah Very good let me begin uh, by saying uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Welcome to class number five of ITKI 6205, 6204, uh, Sociology of Religion and Culture. Today is Sunday, 19 March 2023, and we are in the winter trimester, uh, February to April 2023, of IKI Academy. And I am honored to be your instructor, Dr. Omar Al Talib, and to share with you the knowledge and the experiences that we have had, and to learn from you as well what you know and what you have learned in this very important field of religion and culture. Let me begin by noting that, uh, as I had indicated in the class uh, dates, the schedule that I had placed in the Telegram group, that we will soon be blessed with the month of Ramadan. Inshallah, this blessed month of fasting and giving and sharing and coming together will be a truly wonderful spiritual, social, and community experience for all of us. Uh, for some Muslims, it will begin on Wednesday, 12 March, so uh, in the coming few days. Uh, in some communities, it could be a day before, a day after. We begin here by wishing everyone a blessed and happy uh, Ramadan in advance for you and your spouses and your children and parents and loved ones and neighbors and community members and the entire Ummah, inshallah. Also, at the end of Ramadan, as you know, uh, there will be Eid al Fitr for three days, and I have listed on the schedule uh, the uh, <coughs> Uh, probable date of Friday 21 April for Eid al-Fitr. So uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday during Eid al-Fitr we will not be having our Google Meet. Inshallah we encourage everybody to celebrate uh, the Eid al-Fitr uh, and to be with their uh, family and loved ones and community members. Uh, also, uh, I recognize that during Ramadan, uh, the class time may conflict with many uh, different possible activities such as iftar or suhoor or taraweeh or other commitments. So it is uh, no problem, inshallah. Please mention to me, let me know if you will have any uh, conflicts with the timing for the class. Uh, so that, inshallah, uh, I will uh, be able to uh, understand any possible absence. And inshallah, uh, just like we are recording the class today, you will be able to benefit from uh, the recordings of the class uh, and uh, be able to uh, engage in the wonderful uh, month of Ramadan uh, without losing the benefits of uh, this course. Uh, again, anybody with any questions or thoughts or ideas, uh, we welcome them, uh, particularly during this holy month of Ramadan. We would like to hear how your family, your community, your country shares in the blessed experience of fasting Ramadan and celebrating Eid al-Fitr uh, next month, inshallah. Uh, I will begin uh, today's class, uh, which will be a uh, 
certain time period uh, today, about half an hour, uh, by asking the question of what does sociology of religion say about Ramadan? Uh, so Ramadan is a holy experience, it is a religious experience, but it is also a sociological and cultural experience. So what do we mean by that? Uh, well, we notice as scholars, as sociologists, as scientists, that one of the very important uh, aspects of Ramadan, uh, yes, Sister Safiya, uh, the time during Ramadan, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Nigeria time is going to be within Iftar, Maghrib and Tarawih time. Okay, so thank you, Safiya, for pointing that out. So uh, I will uh, keep that in mind uh, when uh, the classes start uh, occurring in Ramadan. Uh, and for any of you who will be engaging in uh, <coughs> the uh, Maghrib, uh, the Iftar, and the uh, Tarawih, uh, then uh, no need to worry, inshallah. Uh, the uh, class will be available through the uh, YouTube videos that uh, we are recording. May Allah bless you, Safiya. Uh, for alerting us to this uh, matter. So going back to uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, sociology of religion when understanding uh, Ramadan, uh, one of the most important aspects of uh, Ramadan, so we have the spiritual aspects, the religious aspects, fulfilling uh, the commandments of uh, the Creator of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you know, the five pillars of Islam uh, the <coughs> shahada, the testimony of faith, uh, the prayers, the salah, uh, the zakah, the poor do, uh, the fasting, Ramadan, and the hajj, the pilgrimage. So Ramadan is definitely, uh, fasting during Ramadan is one of the uh, five pillars of Islam, uh, the most important tenets of the faith. So that is from the religious perspective. From the sociology perspective, we can see and notice that Ramadan brings people together. So it is a group activity. So it could be bringing the family members together. It could be bringing additional relatives and extended family together. It could be bringing together different families. It could be bringing together friends. It could be bringing together neighbors. It could be bringing together uh, different members of the community uh, and throughout uh, the uh, Muslim communities around the world uh, we notice that uh, there is what uh, can be referred to as a group iftar so uh, after uh, the prayer of Maghrib uh, at sundown uh, when Muslims during Ramadan come together to break their fast uh, it can be done uh, as a community activity so some mosques, some masjids, and this may occur in your own communities, and we would love to hear about that. Uh, they have a, a group breaking of the fast. You go to the masjid, and there are the meals set up after uh, Maghrib uh, for people uh, to eat. Uh, this can happen in the masjid or the community center, or even in the neighborhood. Uh, there might be uh, people or organizations uh, setting up food uh, for people to eat uh, made available uh, by those who have donated the food uh, or cooked the food uh, or it could be a potluck style. So in different ways it is a wonderful and amazing community event that brings to people together. It brings people together uh, for food but also brings people together for prayer and then you have the special prayers during Ramadan, uh, after uh, Isha prayer, uh, what, as you know, is called the Tarawih prayer, uh, the uh, extra evening prayers uh, that are not required, but are encouraged uh, for people to engage in uh, during Ramadan. Uh, and they can stretch anywhere from uh, a few rak'ahs to uh, 21 or 23 rak'ahs or more. Uh, and it can uh, intersect with uh, Qiyamul Layl, praying throughout the night, uh, and Tahajjud, uh, extended uh, prayer, uh, maybe sometimes until Fajr, uh, until Suhoor. So all this uh, eating together and praying together is part of the group aspect uh, of Ramadan, 
which might not normally occur uh, during the rest of the year. Uh, in addition to the uh, group activity, Ramadan involves a charitable activity. So people give money and give food uh, to those in need, uh, to members of the community, to the homeless, uh, to those who are bankrupt, uh, to neighbors who uh, might not have uh, a good income. So this is uh, yet another aspect of the wonderful uh, and amazing experience of Ramadan uh, that is particularly relevant uh, to those uh, who are studying sociology of uh, religion and uh, culture. Now, we can talk about these things as being some of the amazing and wonderful and incredible aspects of Ramadan, but we should also not forget that while Islam encourages us to come together and to eat together and to pray together and to help those in need, not every Muslim necessarily follows these guidelines. So while many Muslims do engage in uh, providing food and money to the needy in Ramadan, uh, and many community members, they share their iftar with others, and they engage in prayer with others, some people choose not to get involved in those activities. So this could be uh, one issue. Or the other issue is we have the issue, the problem, uh, the uh, concern, and that is overconsumption. So what do I mean by overconsumption? Uh, meaning that uh, for iftar, if there are 10 people, uh, people might cook for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 people or order food from restaurants. That is way more than what is uh, needed or uh, intended to be consumed. So this consumption orientation this showing off or this provision of too much than what is necessary is also an issue that occurs particularly during Ramadan. Now, not only is there uh, sometimes too much food, but people also respond, unfortunately, sometimes by eating too much. So while Ramadan is trying to teach us control, uh, control of our desires, control of our thirst, control of our hunger, control of our uh, God-given uh, sex drive. Yet people, unfortunately, uh, especially during iftar, uh, not only uh, eat, but they lose control over eating. Rather than eating what is uh, enough and healthy for the body, the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, taught us, they eat too much. And it becomes worse when people eat too much of the unhealthy foods. So while Ramadan should be a time of health, purifying our body of the toxins uh, and the uh, <coughs> chemicals and the uh, terrible things we put in our body throughout the year, and Ramadan is meant to get rid of those bad things in our body. Sometimes people end up uh, either cooking the kind of food, uh, on the one hand, it should be healthy, it should be wholesome, it should be based upon the great fruits and vegetables in their uh, purest form that Allah, the Creator, has provided for humanity. Some of us end up making lots of food, and a lot of that food can be unhealthy food full of carbohydrates, full of salt, full of sugar, uh, full of uh, rice and bread that has been stripped of its uh, healthy parts. And so it tastes good, and it looks good, and it is impressive, but it is unhealthy. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a world where some people are starving, while other people, and I'm talking about Muslims, uh, both Muslims and non-Muslims, while other people are eating junk food, eating food that is making them obese, that is making them too fat. Uh, and I am uh, one of uh, the people who, unfortunately, is suffering from this, uh, along with uh, some of my friends and family uh, and neighbors 
Uh, so I'm not only, I'm not attacking anybody. I'm simply stating a fact that many of us end up, end up eating, especially during Ramadan, what is unhealthy. Uh, uh, we should be reducing our uh, carbohydrate intake, uh, the uh, items that are in our diet that end up being converted into sugar uh, and fat in our body. In Ramadan, sometimes too much consumption occurs and too much unhealthy food is uh, consumed. Again, uh, we point out here the practice of the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he relied on healthy food and small quantities, controlled quantities. And many times the Prophet went hungry <coughs> uh, as opposed to uh, overeating and becoming uh, bloated. And what is happening with this uh, years and years of consumption of bad food, uh, as you know, we have diabetes, we have uh, heart uh, disease, we have <clears throat> the breakdown uh, and the uh, problems with our liver and kidneys uh, and our digestive system, uh, which is truly uh, a tragedy. So <clears throat> coming back to uh, Ramadan and the fasting and the idea of deprivation. Uh, it is not easy to deny your body the things it desires and it is like it likes. So uh, eating is a natural instinct. All of us, of course, uh, as God has uh, decided for us with our bodies, we must eat to get energy. But the kind of food we eat and the number of times we eat uh, and the quantity of food we eat and the quality of food we eat is something that the Quran tells us must be controlled and regulated. So in the spectrum between very healthy food, natural food, good food on the one end, uh, and poisonous food, chemical-filled food, unhealthy food, uh, unnatural food, uh, bad food, we have a spectrum. So we should be moving toward the healthy side, not the health unhealthy side. And many people in Ramadan uh, try to adhere to this wonderful principle uh, that the Quran teaches uh, about trying and sticking to what is healthy and good for us. But unfortunately in Ramadan, a lot of what is presented or consumed or eaten uh, is more toward the unhealthy side. Uh, now, uh, as individuals, we are supposed to learn deprivation, controlling our desire for food uh, and sex and water during Ramadan. This is, uh, uh, in, in, in one way, a psychological uh, phenomenon. We train ourselves to be able to deprive our bodies and control our bodies and control our desires. In addition to the psychological side, self-control, there is the sociological side. And that is, while we are purifying our bodies and creating control over our bodies, we are supposed to become better people toward other people. So we are improving our bodies, strengthening our mind, getting rid of toxins in our own body, but also we are reducing the bad aspects when we deal with other people and increasing the good aspects. So we should always treat people in a good way, in a civilized way, in a correct way, but especially during Ramadan, when we focus on getting rid of bad things in our body uh, and bad ideas and bad thoughts, there should also be the component of getting rid of negative behavior toward other people and replacing it with positive behavior. So this brings both the psychological and the sociological aspects uh, together, particularly uh, during Ramadan. Any questions so far at this point or thoughts or comments? Okay, Tawfiq has asked to join us. Very good. Now, uh, here I talked about sociology of religion, 
there's also sociology of culture. And as I had mentioned, sociology of culture deals with food uh, and clothing and habits uh, and language. Um, so uh, we notice throughout the Muslim world uh, and throughout the Muslim communities, uh, there is uh, a, the practice of fasting during Ramadan and celebrating Eid, but it shows up in different ways. So the, the food that is cooked and presented in Ramadan differs throughout Muslim communities. The clothes that we wear differs throughout uh, various uh, Muslim communities. And one of the things that is a goal of the practice of fasting in Ramadan, yes, uh, Tawfiq, did, were you going to add something? Okay. Um, so, so one of the goals during Ramadan, uh, in addition to bringing people together, is to reduce the differences between people. So there are differences between rich and poor. There are differences between highly educated and lower educated. There are differences between people who are uh, able to access many resources and those who are not able to access many resources. There are differences between people who are very healthy and those who are unhealthy. There are differences between people uh, who are uh, able to get uh, better jobs and those who are uh, not able to get good jobs. So there's all kinds of differences between people. One of the aspects of Ramadan is the hope, the desire, the goal of reducing these differences and bringing people together despite all these differences and in spite of all these differences. So people come to eat together from different uh, backgrounds and languages and cultures and economic groups uh, and people pray together uh, regardless of how much money they have or don't have how much knowledge they have or don't have uh, how much education they have or don't have how tall or short they are uh, how uh, large or small they are all that is irrelevant when people come together for iftar and for taraweeh prayers and for the gatherings of Ramadan and Eid. This is the goal. Uh, this is the uh, hope. Uh, this is what is desired. It sometimes happens more, it sometimes happens less, and so in the sociology, sociology of culture, uh, scholars study to what extent is uh, are these differences reduced and people brought together, and to what extent are they the same or they stay or sometimes uh, enhanced? So it used to be a long time ago uh, throughout uh, Africa and Asia and people where uh, Islamic civilization was thriving that the same neighborhood would have rich people, poor people, middle income people, and they would have uh, iftar in the streets in front of their houses, everybody together. Unfortunately, what has happened uh, in the modern era is that rich people are living far away from poor people and middle-income people. And when that happens, all the poor people are by themselves, the rich people are by themselves, the middle-income people are by themselves. So it is, uh, unfortunately, in all societies, including Muslim, including Muslim societies, there is an increase in stratification. What is stratification? Let me write this word here uh, because it is important in sociology. Stratification. It comes from geology. Uh, and any of you who have studied geology, you know there are different layers of rock uh, in the earth, uh, in uh, underneath us, underground. So there may be uh, one kind of rock and then another kind of rock and another kind of rock. So those are layers. So uh, the uh, geology uh, of the earth is stratified. There are different kinds of rocks and different layers of rocks. So sociology has borrowed this term, uh, this idea, this word, and used it to describe human societies. So we see also layers in human society. The obvious one or the most obvious one might be the income layer. 
there are rich people, poor people, middle people, and uh, sometimes it is not obvious, sometimes it is very obvious. So like I was saying, where people live, most people, whether Muslim or otherwise, are aware of where the rich people are living, where the poor people are living, maybe where the middle income people are living, uh, the kind of houses they have, the kind of cars they drive, uh, or uh, transportation might not even be available. Uh, uh, and so some people are deprived of transportation, while other people have so many cars, more than they need, uh, and more than they will ever use in their lifetime. So this is called stratification uh, by income. There can be a stratification by color. There can be a stratification by uh, degrees and uh, education. There's different ways of uh, stratification. So uh, that's why sociologists talk about socioeconomic aspects of society. So uh, the uh, socioeconomic variables would include income and uh, education. The two most important or two of the most important uh, variables, two of the most important aspects, two of the most important factors when studying society, when studying human beings, is their money uh, and their uh, knowledge, their education, uh, how much schooling they have or formal schooling. So we call those two factors uh, the, uh, the economic factor and the uh, social factor, uh, basically income and education. Now, how does this relate to Ramadan? In Ramadan, those who have more income are supposed to help those who have less income. In addition, those who have more knowledge are supposed to help those who have less knowledge. Now, this can be facilitated through the masjid, through the mosque. It can be facilitated through the neighborhood. Uh, it can be facilitated through the schools. There's different ways of doing it. But the point is that uh, there is an encouragement in uh, Islamic civilization, in Islamic thought, to help each other in different ways and in many ways and in all ways. Because some people assume, uh, and this is very common, that helping means giving money. And of course, money is important. It is a part of it. But it is not the only way to help people. In fact, uh, as the studies have shown, it may be much better for somebody if you help them get a job, you train them to get a job, you uh, give them opportunities for a job, this may be much more important for them than just giving them cash, than just giving them uh, your local currency or dollars or uh, euros or uh, any other uh, money, uh, cash, uh, that is uh, provided to people. So you see the difference? Um, Money can be given, but it is a short term. And it may help somebody have food for a day or a week or a month. But the job, income, uh, a, uh, a regular source of uh, bounty uh, that will help support a family, this is way more important than uh, just uh, the cash. We should be doing both, but one is a long-term solution that makes a lot more sense. Once people have a job, then they can support themselves and their families, and their families, especially their children, can be more educated, so they can get out of the cycle of poverty. But if, you, if we just keep giving money to poor people, and only giving money, then as we know from history, uh, they will still stay poor, their children will stay poor, their children's children will stay poor, so we have not solved the problem. It may look good, and we might feel great about ourselves, and we might say to Allah, Oh Allah, I have given thousands uh, to uh, people who are poor. And some people say, that's great, and that's wonderful, and you get rewarded, and you may get into heaven. But if we invest in our communities, if we empower those who are uh, less, who have less money, who have less education, 
to help them get the jobs and to help them get the education, then they can get out of poverty, which is really the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is not just one meal or 10 meals, right? The ultimate goal is for everybody to be uplifted, everybody to have halal income, uh, halal rizq, we might say in Arabic, uh, the, the blessing of a source of support, of, of money for their family that they can then use to develop their family over time. So this is a critical aspect that needs to be known uh, and that is very important when we talk about socioeconomic uh, aspects, whether it is Ramadan uh, or uh, Eid al-Fitr or any other type of uh, development perspective. And we can take this to the international level. So we have countries, some have money, some have the need for money. So what happens is many countries that are rich, they put the money in something called the World Bank or International Monetary Fund. And then the World Bank or International Monetary Fund takes the money of the rich countries and makes loans to the poor countries. Okay, many people say this is wonderful, this is great. But in reality what happens is, unfortunately, some of the governments of the poorer countries use this money maybe to build a better airport or better roads to the presidential palace or have a nice garden but it doesn't solve the long-term needs of the people and a lot of times it's spent on big projects that are failures that go bankrupt uh, and so we have examples from africa and asia massive dams or uh, huge uh, uh, amazing uh, development projects of uh, housing that are empty uh, that are uh, uninhabited, that are not being used, that are a total waste. So this is critical, you see. So whether it is uh, at the individual level or the country level, we want to avoid waste. One of the major and important lessons of Ramadan is to help but not to encourage waste. Uh, waste has become part of societies all over the world, Muslim and non-Muslim, and it is a tragedy. And rich people, many of them don't waste, many of them do waste, but also poor people who need uh, as much as they can. Sometimes even poor people, uh, they don't waste, but sometimes poor people also waste. Uh, and so wasting... Uh, throwing away things that uh, are uh, useful, that are good, uh, that should be utilized, is really one of the major issues that has not been solved yet. And we see this in many Muslim countries, especially many rich Muslim countries. So much food is thrown away in the garbage during Ramadan. Because remember, I mentioned earlier, they cook too much food, or they buy too much food, or they bring too much food from the restaurant and people eat what they can, but what is left? Thrown away. This is a huge tragedy. And you even see it during Hajj uh, and uh, during Umrah. So during the pilgrimage in Mecca, whether it is the lesser pilgrimage, the Umrah, or the bigger pilgrimage, uh, the Hajj, especially during Ramadan, uh, a lot of people donate a lot of money uh, to have uh, sheep sacrificed and cows sacrificed and camels sacrificed but there's not enough people there to eat it, so the rest is thrown away. Millions of pounds of food is thrown away in one place of the Muslim world, uh, while millions of Muslims uh, are starving and go hungry in other parts of uh, the world. Okay, any questions so far uh, on anything we have uh, talked about? Uh, I am very happy to have uh, today with us uh, Brother Bashiro and Safiya and Tawfiq. Uh, I am uh, honored and uh, glad that uh, you have uh, joined our class. And uh, I wish all of you uh, a great and happy and wonderful uh, Ramadan. Uh, and I uh, am uh, hopeful and optimistic uh, that you will share some of the things we talked about in class 
with your own uh, spouses and children and friends and neighbors and family uh, and inshallah uh, this will be an opportunity uh, for the knowledge to be a sadaqa jariya, a continuous uh, charity where what we learn helps others and then they take what they learn and help other people uh, and so on uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, so uh, are there any questions or thoughts or concerns at this point? No? Okay, well here I will end the class uh, and I will uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next week, inshallah. Uh, may Allah bless you. Uh, may Allah reward you. Uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar, for the for the perspective share.